What week one told us about the global environment for 2023 fantasy football. That's what we're going to talk about today on Stealing Bananas. I'm Ben Gretsch. You can find my Stealing Signals newsletter at bengretsch.substack.com. With me, as always, is Sean Siegel. You can find all his fantastic work at Rotoviz. Sean, we did the little Sunday night recap. We have just obviously it's, it's week one. We have so many things we can talk about. You and I just spent a bunch of time before the show talking through Puka Nakua. We're very in on Puka Nakua. For anyone who is curious about that, we might talk about him a little bit. But a fun guy. Uh, you can read about um, him in, in our work this week as well. But, Sean, the biggest thing is we kind of talk through it in the ways that we're kind of viewing what could be, I guess, most impactful for our show this today, right? That would be the most fun for listeners is when everyone is talking about micro concepts and player takes and usage and what it means for each player and each offense that they got X amount of snaps or these things happened or those things happened, that we could kind of take a little bit of a 30,000 foot view and think about the entire macro environment, the league itself, because there's some really interesting stuff that happened in week one that tips us to what 2023 could look like for fantasy football, for real football, for the sport going forward. It's something we love to talk about, these concepts, and it definitely applies back, obviously, to the decisions we have to make with our actual teams in fantasy. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, it's probably not being discussed enough in the the jumble of week one and the and, and so much data and information about each of these individual players but what a, what an interesting week in turn I, I think there was a lot you could really take in terms of what 2023 is going to look like there was and there's some really exciting things i think the number one thing for me is that i love football i'm glad it's back <laughs> week one was very exciting you know, anybody who's gotten a chance to read your two pieces coming out and stealing signals, I think feels that enthusiasm. I wrote the longest piece I've ever written for Rotoviz and, you know, covered a variety of different things from, you know, sort of the good and bad emotions of Monday night. Some of the elements where if you're one of your early players got off to a terrible start that they're are some positives and minuses there and then going through these different teams and my notes about a lot of the individual teams were, were maybe a little bit downbeat because a lot of the offenses didn't look fantastic and Ben that's something that you and I talked about before the show I'm very optimistic about I guess people in general and football in general and fantasy football in general. And so I believe a lot of these teams are going to come up with solutions. One of the things that I think is really helpful for week one this year is that the fantastic squads, the true powerhouses of the sport outside of the San Francisco 49ers were terrible, at least on offense. The Chiefs were terrible. The Bengals were, <laughs> I mean, terrible doesn't even describe what they were. The Bills looked just as confused in their game as they looked in their playoff upset loss at home. And the Eagles, despite you know leading and arguably somewhat easily defeating the New England Patriots, they looked confused and bad on offense, which in some ways that might be the most surprising. Yeah. Because you would think that they have the most variety they can go to. They would have the most, I won't say easy answers. There are no easy answers, but they have the, again, the widest variety of answers that they can bring to the table from a tactical perspective. But you shared with me uh, something about, you know, kind of where we were <laughs> from an over under perspective. And while I think that 
we're going to see a lot of... Oh, so my main point on this is that when you have these elite teams play really poorly, it, it really illustrates to you that you've got to take week one with a grain of salt and as its own thing, and you've got to understand that people are going to improve. If Patrick Mahomes and Jalen Hurts and Josh Allen can look that bad, then you've got to give a break to some of the guys who are getting their first chances. I mean, Colm and I did a show on Sam Howell. We kind of had fun with it. We kind of had fun with it in my article basically just linking to the show and, you know, referring to it as the full Sam Howell experience, especially after seeing what some of these other quarterbacks did, I think Sam Howell actually looked fantastic. And I'm very optimistic about how that's going to go if the team decides to lean into the positives. So these teams are going to get better and we're going to have a lot of positive things. One of the other, you know, almost micro types of things, but something I really want to remind myself about is probably the biggest disappointment for me outside of injuries is that we didn't get a little bit more flash from a JSN, didn't get a little bit more flash from a Quinton Johnston, didn't get a little bit more flash from a Marvin Mims. Those three guys, really exciting. And yet it's rookies in week one. And so when you have that, and then especially contrasted in this case, not with like elite quarterbacks playing poorly on the quarterback side, but well, you have that contrasted with a Puka Nakua situation, you're like it becomes even more disappointing because it does underline for you that coming out in week one and having a big game is possible. It's not like the rookies had no chance or there was no ability to do that. But again, and that really highlights not just Puka's value and talent and all of those things, but also the offense in general, something we're going to talk about here. And it may be the offense specifically that is the thing you're the most excited about. But having said all of that, Ben, these trends that we did you know, three or four shows on this season, I linked again in my article if anybody's having trouble finding any of those. Those trends that we were worried about and that aren't particularly fun, they <laughs> reared their head again in week one in a big, big way. Yeah, and I mean, that's, I think, what was maybe most interesting about week one. You mentioned the over-unders, the, the note I gave you was that um, the unders just hit in general in week one, pretty big 12 and four. Um, the unders went 12 and four across the 16 games. And I'm sure the over unders are going to come down pretty quickly like they did last year. Um, so I, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that the unders just continue to hit forever because the, we're just going to get lower and lower numbers. But the big question in week one, I think was, do some of these offenses have a counterpunch this year? Because the big thing that we talked about so much was the lack of explosive plays, the lack of deep passing, the you know the the wide nine stuff on the defensive line that is stopping outside zone and also taking away explosives in the run game or attempting to. Uh, the offenses that did combat that successfully, in a lot of ways, being able to utilize QB mobility to be surprisingly effective, the ones that were surprisingly effective that weren't expected to be good, in a lot of cases, utilized QB mobility, the ones that really took off. And you talked about the Eagles, and I definitely want to hit on that. But you saw their use of QB mobility. Jalen Hurts led the NFL in design runs by like 40. We talked about this a lot in the offseason. And his ability as a designed rusher and it's a skill it's a strength of this offense opening the interior running creating yards before contact lanes for miles sanders to be just elite at that stat uh and then also when you're attacking multiple ways in the run game to then have an rpo game and the pat you know to help some with some easy passes and then eventually you know a downfield passing game as well more like a more traditional passing game in their offense too and like you just said answers across the board but the mobile qb element that makes it so that the rushing game can be multi-dimensional and dynamic huge huge when defenses are trying to make you matriculate the ball down the field as we've talked about and, and take a lot of plays so the question was what what were offenses going to do and one of the things that we struggled with as we talked about it sean and i know i i had a hard time envisioning what these answers were we talked a lot about the play callers series that jordan rodriguez did over at the athletic fantastic series on the kyle, kyle shanahan sort of coaching tree sean mcveigh coaching tree whatever you want to call it matt lafleur 
Mike McDaniel, all of those guys interviewed a ton for the series, even, you know, like Robert Sala, who was a defensive coordinator, you know, worked with these guys, was interviewed a good amount. A lot of really interesting conversation about what the offenses are trying to accomplish, what the defenses are trying to accomplish, and how these things have evolved. Since really about the middle of 2021, 2020, a massively positive offensive season, which was in part because there were no fans in the stands. We had road teams playing much better, quiet stadiums. And then in 2021, about midway through the year, ADOT start falling. I know I was writing about it in Stealing Signals. I thought this was a really odd thing. First, it was Mahomes, and it was, then it was Allen. And then a few weeks later, I remember I did a, a, a picture from one of my spreadsheets of the weekly passing ADOTs, and I just picked out like 12 or 14 different quarterbacks and said, look at this. Like, it's weird, but there's – you know, all of these quarterbacks were throwing on a weekly basis, and obviously there's fluctuation on weekly passing ADOT, but they were throwing at a much higher rate over the first six or eight weeks. And then suddenly, whenever this kind of dropped off over, you know, and I, I did must have done this after week 12 or something, but from the next six weeks, all of these guys almost every week were putting up season lows in ADOT. It was, it was, it was happening in the middle of 2021. It happened all throughout 2022 where the passing a dots came down the air yards came down we this is now widely known information it's uh, somebody sent me espn wrote a big article about it right before the season started where do the air yards go why are offenses like this now uh, again there's a big part of the play callers uh series there's a lot of discussion around the nfl on these trends but the ability to Again, going back to the mobile quarterback thing and having the ability to when, when defenses are, are sitting back and they're and, and I don't understand all the, the mechanics of it, but forcing you to matriculate the ball down the field that you're able to run, you're able to actually do that effectively matters. So to your point, I, I totally understand what you're saying about the Eagles being almost the most notable of all of the offenses struggling. But the broader point to me, I mean, because they theoretically should have had answers, right? They should have had answers either running the ball or passing the ball. They have the different answers. But even more broadly, when you look at the group you talked about, <clears throat> the Bills and the Chiefs and the Bengals and the Eagles, I think week one, it was just so clear that the counter punch isn't there yet in the NFL for the offenses. And that one of the... I, I kind of didn't finish this thought, but one of the main things that I struggled with in the offseason about this and about these defenses was what's going to change? These defenses are not suddenly going to stop doing what they're doing. I, in a chat that I had with uh, some uh, in the in the ship chasing discord with, with some some questions I got, I, I wrote that I kind of felt like this was the end game for defensive philosophy, taking away the explosives at the NFL level, especially. And so I don't know what would change. I don't know. Defenses aren't going to suddenly stop this. And as, even if offenses get better and they get more efficient underneath and they're able to matriculate the ball better, what you don't want is what Miami was able to do, 8.2 yards per play, explosive plays, and long touchdowns all over the field. And you saw what the Lions were able to get out of forcing the Chiefs underneath. All it takes is one Kadarius Tony drop. You get a pick six. You upset the, the defending Super Bowl champions by one in their in their home field. And you do it largely because of that play, because you made them take a bunch of underneath stuff and they've made a mistake. And that's what we talked about all offseason. Eventually, a mistake's going to get made. And the way that you describe it there, I think, really drives it home for me, where the way that you can beat an elite quarterback is to almost take it out of his hands. Because once the ball's in the air, he can't control what Sky Moore does. He can't control what Kadarius Tony does. The coaching staff has to control some of these things by making better personnel decisions, both you know, before the season starts and then you know using the guys who might be exciting in terms of a Rasheed Rice or a Justin Ross. Some of that is developmental. One of the things I thought was the most disappointing in week one was the conservatism that we saw in terms of using young players and or recent acquisitions. I think sometimes the recent acquisitions is almost a little bit more troubling when you think about DeAndre Swift, when you think about Rashad Penny and the huge talent gap that they have to a Kenneth Gainwell, you're like, those guys are not rookies. You just really need them to be able to scale up their ability to run the offense after 
all of these different practices. They need to be ready to go. It seems to me like actually a very bad sign for those two players that they weren't able to do that. Now, one of the things I want to say is just I'm looking at this in both directions for them in that, number one, I still expect them to be the guys, but it is something that I note where both of these players have been electric and we focus on that a lot. And yet both of these players were available (laughs) to the Eagles in different ways at very minimal prices, which would suggest that their previous teams and the rest of the market had some skepticism about these guys. And the skepticism has quickly manifested. But I kind of mentioned that as we work back into this bigger picture of, for me, I think that as these defenses are evolving, the talent of the skill position players is going to matter a lot because some of the things that you're trying to do to beat what defenses are currently doing is going to depend more on winning one-on-ones and individual player talent than it perhaps depends on scheme. And that's something that I kind of feel like is a stealth, unpopular way to look at football currently and a way to look at fantasy football in a way. There are two very different concepts But one of the things that you and I have always talked about is that the talent really matters and is going to drive the workload instead of the other way around. One of my biggest frustrations with the Kansas City Chiefs, for example, is that they have really leaned into this idea that Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid, because they're probably the best at their jobs in the two most important jobs in the NFL, that they can make it work. And they probably still will, right? I mean, there were problems with some of the things last year, and obviously they win the Super Bowl. Patrick Mahomes leads in most categories. Jarek McKinnon catches like nine touchdowns. I mean, Jarek McKinnon, who were calling dead legs Jarek McKinnon like three years ago, is catching nine TDs. So we expect that those teams are going to come out of it. But I do think that having a little bit more talent out there for him would be a big deal. Ben, as you talked, there's so many interesting things here. Layers but it's and not layers. just that the elite QBs struggled, but I thought the interesting part of it, and this was something I, I struggled with for fantasy, where I really enjoy building super teams. And I think that some listeners would be like, well, if you want a super team, draft an elite quarterback and then hit on some other pieces because that's how you get this team that just annihilates everyone and you can't be competed with. And you need that difference-making quarterback. Our hope and our thesis was that Tua was going to actually give you that from a price where you could build the other things in. Now, we're one week in, and so we have to be very careful about believing that that has hit. And certainly we expect the elite QBs to still hit and do their thing as we go along. But when I was looking at elite QBs and when they would make sense in individual drafts and you want to, as you are drafting, to understand that every draft is unique and you want to approach that draft as its own thing. In the situations where it made sense, there was still quite a bit of concern for me because, I mean, the clear-cut passing guy is Patrick Mahomes, and we obviously saw what some of the concerns are there. But for the hybrid QBs, there were also concerns and that these guys, even though a lot of the different numbers on the elite QBs or the hybrid QBs, the rushing QBs, would suggest that in some ways their injury risk is not substantially higher, it's certainly not substantially higher than a bad pocket QB who takes a lot of hits in the pocket because that's very risky as well. But these guys suffered a lot of injuries last year and their teams don't necessarily want to go down that path again. They have to have them in the key moments. If you take away a little bit of that rushing element, and we saw it with Jalen Hurts seeming to perhaps be a little uncertain when he has the big fumble at the end of the game, you had these situations in the bills game where josh allen just i mean he looks so confused and upset and he's got i mean he's trying to laugh through it but i mean his head coach is just pointing to his head after a variety of these plays where he's like you cannot rush like that right you've got to throw the ball away or get down you can't like get to the sidelines and then cut back in and try and hit three or four people but the fact that the player is not being able to play instinctively 
is an issue for them, I think. And then you also have offenses that may be actually transitioning away from that. And you look at the Baltimore Ravens, and this was the one that was the most striking for me, where they threw a billion passes to Zay Flowers behind the line of scrimmage, and he broke some plays because, I mean, he's like a a new Dante Hall with the ball in his hands. He had some really cool runs, but it's the NFL, right? Are you going to be able to break those plays consistently? In this game, Lamar Jackson really struggled as a passer. He really struggled with the offense, but he also didn't seem to bring the rushing element that not only is key for him to put up his points, but I think is extremely important for his teammates. So you mentioned how you open up these running lanes. And one of the things we've talked about for years is that the running backs with the hybrid QBs, yeah, it's a problem because they're probably not going to catch as many passes. They're going to get some goal line work vultured, but they're going to have that yard before contact element that you mentioned. They're going to be efficient on the rushing plays they do have. In this game here, before he goes down, J.K. Dobbins has five yards before contact on eight carries. Justice Hill finishes the game with 10 yards after contact and nine total yards, which means that his average contact point was in the backfield. And it just shouldn't happen in a Lamar Jackson offense. It, it shouldn't happen. And this was hard for me as I was bidding on Hill this week for waivers because Gus Edwards is a guy who I don't think adds anything, and I do think this offense is going to need guys who add something. Obviously, the other players that they're looking at to potentially bulk out this rushing game, also guys who are not going to bring anything. Justice Hill is electric, and so if he could ever stay healthy for a stretch when he could be the guy, then it's really exciting. But having watched week one, the changes that they made to this offense, which they're going to get better at it. You still have Lamar Jackson. It's one of these things where, again, you want to understand that week one is not going to tell you everything about the season. But it was a big concern for me because not only did the entire offense have some issues, but there were specific things to you know how it even works in the run game that were very disturbing. Yeah, he only had Lamar Jackson, I think, two design rushes and that's a problem if the defense doesn't have to respect the design run if you're just sitting back there shotgun the whole time it is taking away one of lamar's biggest strengths which i mean i'm not saying he can't run this louisville offense as they were describing it in the offseason more shotgun more scramble less design running and be effective but it is like and I, i'm not criticizing lamar jackson as a quarterback as a passer for years he's been you know unfairly you know he's told to play receiver uh do receiver drills at the combine he's been called a running back his whole career i'm not commenting on any of that i'm literally just saying this as a positive he is better than a lot of running backs as a runner like he's a he's a pure running running back quarterback in that sense right like when he's actually running in space he's so electric there's that that highlight from a couple years ago where he did the spin move and is somehow accelerating through the spin move in open field and he goes the distance and you're like this is not a quarterback. This is a running back, which is there's there's mobile quarterbacks who are more mobile than a quarterback should be. And then there's Lamar Jackson, who is like literally could be as good as a lot of the running backs in the NFL because he's just that electric. Yeah, it, it always kind of blows my mind where you look at Lamar Jackson versus Saquon Barkley, guys who overlapped in college. And it's like, I mean, you would just think that Saquon Barkley would have been the guy with easily the best rushing production. But I mean, it's Lamar Jackson. And yeah. Again, that's one of the reasons why we want to think about, you know, someone like an Anthony Richardson, for example, as being different. Now, that doesn't mean that he can't manifest that rushing and that athleticism at the NFL level. But Lamar Jackson is a transcendent right. rushing QB. Don't like, take that away. Yeah. And, and when that's the thing that's beating the defenses right now, like, don't take. And then you mentioned Justice Hill. I'm a little concerned, but you, do you know that he had only five carries for 73 yards in the preseason? 14.6 yards per carry? So, I mean, like... Well, I kind of go back to the, the George Pickens thing. I think my favorite quote, and I believe that I'm paraphrasing this. Uh, so, it's not exactly... They asked, like, what was different, you know, playing the 49ers? Or like, what was different in week one versus the preseason? And he was like... Um, 
we're facing NFL starters. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> that's fair, but still, we saw some burst from Justice Hill. I, I wanted to defend him, but Sean, you had um, a ton of great points there. You brought up uh, some stuff about the later round quarterback stuff with Tua. You talked about um, star players winning and making the schemes work. We saw that with Miami. I mean, I think it was a great example where Tyreek Hill is the scheme. I mean, we talked – like Mike McDaniel does an amazing job of scheming. We've given him a ton of credit. But it, it, one of the really fascinating things about Miami last year was how concentrated they were on Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell. And you think about, like, what are, what are defenses trying to do? Like, if it's only two guys, why don't you just triple team them up, right? Like, I mean, why don't you just put us everybody on these guys – but yet they continue to win. And, and obviously there are double team situations. There are, hey, we're rolling a safety over the top of this guy. We have, it's Tyreek Hill. And yet they're still finding ways to win. It's scheme, it's player. But as you were talking through that, Sean, one of the things that I wanted to go back to and emphasize, you know, you were saying as much as, you know, we talk about the scheme, that it probably is more of a player and you're maybe out on a limb on that. And I think that's right. I also, I think there's multiple ways to get at that question though, because I also think there is a floor you have to have from the play caller, right? There is a schematic lower limit to what needs to be there for the talent to be able to succeed in the system, obviously. And I don't think this is a very controversial point. I don't think you would disagree with it, but obviously the, the very easy example We'll just cherry pick right off, uh, you know, the lowest hanging fruit is Arthur Smith, where like, yeah, I mean, we don't even freaking know what Kyle Pitts is. We don't know what Drake well, London, we don't know what their impact on an NFL game could be because he's d- determined to limit the dropbacks, to limit his young quarterback's ability to process a defense, get into a rhythm of reading out plays and throwing downfield. I blamed and stealing signals part of his really low a passing a dot which was a big thing that ritter has gotten hit about this week and i don't think it's entirely fair to just put it on ritter when you only drop him back 18 times he ends up throwing to the running backs nine of those times to Bijan and to algier we don't know what he's been taught or what they're telling him in the in the huddle certainly he's not dropping back and reading out plays downfield as much as other quarterbacks and trying and getting into a rhythm in those things and so i put a little bit of the blame on okay he has this really low a dot on you're not even giving him the opportunities to do it. It's something we talked about uh, with other young quarterbacks in the past, but like the, we, we've talked about the non-obvious and obvious passing downs, throwing on first and tens, throwing with intent. But when defenses aren't expecting it, when you Arthur Smith can design a good run game. We all know this. We all are okay with this. But when you've done that and you force defenses to respect that to a degree, now you throw on non-obvious passing downs. And league-wide quarterback passing efficiency is substantially better on those downs than it is on third and longs. And so you let Desmond Ritter make easier reads on those downs, make some completions down the field on those downs, and then work into – but when you're only throwing 18 times, I haven't looked at the actual game log, but I do remember this was a huge issue in Justin Fields' rookie year. I had a frustration about it where people said, hey, they're not throwing a lot when Fields is out there because Matt Matt Nagy's trying to kind of cover him. But when Andy Dalton was out there, he would throw more. And he, but it, the, the difference was literally just the non-obvious downs. He would throw more on early downs. He'd throw more on the easy downs. He'd let Andy Dalton get the easy completions and get into a rhythm. And my whole point was, what you're doing to the young quarterback, you think you're covering for him, but you're only asking him to throw on the hardest downs. That's a problem for his development and for his ability to be successful and to get into a rhythm, build confidence, all of those things, those very human elements to playing football. And I think, you know, I again, I haven't looked at Ritter's game log, but I think when you see 18 pass attempts, you're probably like, okay, well, he he was asked to, to throw on on third downs probably more, I would guess. I, again, I'm just – but, like, you think about, okay, this is a run first team. The series where they run it on first and down, first and second down and don't gain yards, and then it's third and eight, that's probably when you decide you're going to throw the ball a little bit. I'm hesitant to make that point because, again, I have not actually looked at it. But it's just you're not letting him get into a rhythm – and then we go back to Marcus Mariota last year. People were – and we've talked a lot about how bad Mariota was. He had a lot of really uncatchable throws. But, again, I'm like, man, it can't be easy to play quarterback and get into a rhythm when you're asked to throw once every 30 minutes of real time because you don't even throw one drive and then two drives later. It's like you have 
I, I would have to be playing catch on the sideline in between every single every single series to keep my arm warm. If I, you know, if I was trying to play quarterback in Arthur Smith's system, how are you even gonna know? Like, you know what I mean? It, it's got to be a lot more challenging than the quarterback, and and some of it may just be on on Mariota and on Ritter as well. I'm not trying to completely absolve them, but you talk about those types of schemes, you talk about those types of situations, and and especially when you talk about like a Kyle Pitts. What can Kyle Pitts do? He's not running a whole lot of routes. There was a great clip on Twitter where he completely breaks the ankles of a cornerback and points and laughs at him a little bit. He didn't get called for taunting. Thankfully, he probably should have. But he completely wins on his route, and the ball's not there. And that's you know one of the few times he was even allowed to run a route. But they drop back so few times. He also makes just an incredible play through defensive pass interference and double coverage, 34-yard gain. But like you only threw the ball his direction three times. You only threw it Drake London's direction once all game long. And that's, I mean, so there's a scheme, I think, floor as well. And it's not just Atlanta. There's several other spots I think we could point to and say what they're doing is limiting the talented skill position player's ability to impact the game because they're misusing and those types of things. So you do need, I think you're right, that to win against the, the modern defenses, and a lot of offenses aren't winning, you do need talent and you need to be able to win the one-on-ones and you need all of those things, but you also need a coach who understands from a scheme perspective, how to leverage that talent and put them in positions to succeed. You might not have that talent. You might have that talent, but not have the coach. Right. And so in both ways you can then fail. And we've seen too much of that. And we've seen too much that the offenses though, around the league in week one, I'm not saying they're going to be horrible all year again, but in, in terms of looking at week one, and hoping to see some things for fantasy football's sake, for for our sake as fans, that make 2023 a more exciting season than 2022, I think you have to look at what we saw this weekend. And I mean, again, like I, I, I joked, and I'm, I'm going to actually write an article about the, you know, I'm, I'm titling it the the nihilist Gu- guide to fantasy football. Like I'm not trying to be too nihilistic here, but I do think there's a little bit of a man, like maybe football just sucks now. And maybe nobody on offense could score points except like a handful of guys. If you want to win in fantasy football still in that environment, you do have to be willing to embrace the fact that some of these offenses are just not going to be fun. They're maybe not that's pessimist fun. in me. Maybe that's pessimist in me. And I mean, There's there's definitely a good, at least it's an ethos joke in there. When you talk about the Falcons, though, we really have to separate <laughs> reality versus fantasy when we think about the talent. Because one of the things that Arthur Smith really came out with both barrels against the media, and I, we both sort of drug him over the coals, and yet I also like to look at this from his perspective, where he's like, you guys just do not understand the value of having massive talents as decoys. Because his point is that if you have Kyle Pitts and Drake London out there, the defense has to respect that. And then the things that I can do with Bijan Robinson and Tyler Algier are pretty crazy. If you have MBS and Sky Moore out there, then the things that you can do in the rushing game are going to be different certainly if you have a Marcus Mariota now one of the things with the the Chiefs obviously is that they do continue to get asked to run and unlike the Falcons they have no answers because they have Isaiah Pacheco and Clyde Edwards-Alaire instead of Bijan Robinson and Tyler Algier who are probably two of the six or seven best backs in football I mean Bijan very clearly Tyler Algier was extraordinary in week one you mentioned the A dot you mentioned the passes one of the things here that I thought was interesting is that it's always a little bit of a trap to look at one stretch of a season. I mean, we talk about looking at week one as being a trap. Even looking at, you know, four or five weeks, you look at the end of last season. One of the things that I think, I mean, could end up being a little bit of a trap is just how different the offense was with Desmond Ritter as opposed to with Marcus Mariota. And so I, that was a reason for optimism. One of the things for him is that his actual – EP as a QB last season was fine. It was well within the range that you could play him and win with him in fantasy so much different than week one in his starts last year, he averaged 230 air yards in week one. He gets like 63, right? And nine 
of the 17 sort of actual targets were to the running backs. I mean, you're not going to have an ADOT of any meaningful distance when more than half of the passes go to him. Now, there were 18 attempts. One of them was caught by Ritter himself. And so that one, <laughs> you know, out of the passes that were not caught by Desmond Ritter in the backfield, <laughs> you have 17, nine of which go to the running backs. I wrote around halftime on Twitter, or almost a half, and Desmond Ritter has more catches than Kyle Pitts and Drake London combined because he had a catch and neither of those two had any. And people were quote tweeting that, Sean, until the end of the game, pointing out that he still had more than Drake London. And he finished with more than Drake London. But Pitts, Pitts caught two balls, so he got ahead of him. But good Lord. We're going to see some spike weeks from the receivers in this offense because the running backs are crazy. I mean, they're absolutely crazy. What you saw from Bijan Robinson in week one was insane. So it'll be interesting to watch these teams evolve. But as you mentioned here, you have to respect the scheme limitations. And then you have to respect the scheme strengths. And so that takes us to all of these, again, Shanahan offenses, where you have the Dolphins and what they're doing with the combination of scheme and talent. And again, I think it's important to look at the big picture because for me, there actually was almost zero concern that defenses had figured out how to stop the Dolphins. The concern there is that all three of those main guys with the two receivers, they get nicked up a lot. And then obviously with two of you have the concussions. That's the concern for me, not that defenses are going to be able to figure them out. The 49ers, as you mentioned, Death Star, they're more or less unstoppable. And one of the things there is, I mean, people are really excited about Brandon Ayuk. They should be. People are in some ways maybe disappointed about Debo Samuel. His peripherals were actually very good. He's going to have a fantastic season. Christian McCaffrey, superstar, he's going to have a fantastic season. And then George Kittle, you should be buying because that offense is going to create a an absolute ton of value. And then you have, I mean, one of the things that was most interesting to me was that Jordan Love actually looked terrible in week one. And yet Matt LaFleur was able to get him and the pieces in that offense was able to get Romeo Dobbs. Obviously now you have a little bit of a concern with Aaron Jones because I, sadly, I think, because I've always liked AJ Dillon, but the gap between those guys, which had seemingly closed down a little bit a couple of years ago is now as wide as the Grand Canyon. I mean, right. Aaron Jones might be the best running back <laughs> in football. He's certainly one of these guys in the top five or He's six. He's certainly a lot better than AJ Dillon. The, the alternative is that AJ Dillon might be the worst running back in football. <laughs> He, he's struggling and you can, I mean, I, I don't know if this has been cons- confirmed, but the supposition was that the Packers were trying to get Jonathan Taylor in a trade where they would have set AJ Dillon plus obviously back. Yeah. And that you're wanting to go with that one, two punch. One of the things that I think is interesting about yeah, this, and again, be, it's, that has to be the assumption. I've written that in a couple of places as well. Like it's not, Aaron Jones is older, has this big contract, and they see him as like a hybrid receiver, and they, he does different slashing things. And they, you could see them trading for Taylor and seeing those guys as a thunder lightning, and and then Taylor being the future, and Jones obviously not being you know around around forever. He's twenty eight. The very clear indication with their interest in Jonathan Taylor, it doesn't need to be confirmed, is that they aren't interested in, in AJ Dillon anymore. And when you watch him run, you see why. And this kind of goes back, I mean, we're all human. We're all going to try and find pieces of evidence that fit our thesis, even if we're telling ourselves that that's not what we're doing, that it's a, a more neutral type of process. But when you look at the 49ers last year going after Christian McCaffrey, where, I mean, my understanding is that that move was bashed in some quarters because running backs don't matter. And yet to me, that seemed like number one, highway robbery. And number two, one of the greatest moves that a team could possibly make. And then this off season, you see that the teams that are going after Jonathan Taylor, I mean, the first thing that jumps out to you is that the Kansas city chiefs desperately need a player like that. The Minnesota Vikings desperately need a player like that to offset some of the things that they're doing in their passing game. But who are the teams that are actually going after it? The Dolphins are going after it. The Packers are going after it. And these teams, again, in the Shanahan tree, that number one seems to have answers, but number two seems to be prioritizing the speed and the individual playmakers to amplify what their schemes will do. 
that part to me is fascinating because you have teams yeah. that seem somewhat set. I mean, Raheem Mostert is good. Jeff Wilson is inter- is injured, but good. They picked a chain because he's blazingly fast, which again, fits what Miami and some of these other teams, again, in this mold are trying to, you look at what Aaron Jones did in that game. And again, it was just, it was kind of disappointing because you look at the final numbers and like Jordan love, you're like he's, he's got it. He's, he's getting it. He's going to be good. And then you watch, it's like, Man, this is this was a little bit like the Michael Pittman thing, where in the Pittman thing they just didn't cover him at all. With the Aaron Jones thing, it's actually that he <laughs> is just like a video game guy out there. But almost all of that Jordan Love value is just Aaron Jones running after the catch. But that's what the Dolphins are trying to do with A Chain. They went a step and beyond, and both of those teams are trying to get Jonathan Taylor to do it even more. Dynamic. And it's fascinating because I think you're totally right. And and this is the, the big theme. I don't know if we covered it early on this show, Sean, or before, but it is fascinating that the Kyle Shanahan tree, maybe we already said this, but it, it is who looked good offensively across the NFL. But I love your point about the player talent. And as, as you're saying all of this and like the A-chain thing, like the one thing I would say back is on like A-chain, don't sell the farm for A-chain. Because it, just because a player is on these teams doesn't mean he's going to be successful within these schemes. I think what they're trying to do makes sense. But what's fascinating to me is how quickly they gave up on, like, Chase Edmonds, who they brought in and they traded midseason last year down in Miami. How quickly um, the 49ers were willing to give up on day two running backs two years in a row with Trey Sermon and Tyrion Davis-Price and – and those guys got a lot of draft capital and they were like done with them very quickly. I think that's evidence to your point that they think that individual players matter so much. The ability to amplify scheme matters so much. Now I, I can't explain why Van Jefferson still running routes for the Rams, but other players within the, the, the Shanahan coaching tree have fallen out of favor so quickly. They're taking their shots on these players and they're trying to get the types of players that are the right ones. But they're also willing, probably even just in practice, but in, in in limited game action to say, this isn't it. This isn't the player. And you you can't know that when you make the acquisitions, when you make the trades, when you sign a guy, you don't know what shape he's going to show up to camp in. All of those things are part of it. But how quickly they're, they've been willing to move on from players, I think, fits into this point that you're making as well, where well, they are the just and the Rams. turning. What's that? One of these things with the 49ers and Rams is they play kind of fast and loose with player evaluation. <laughs> so they do, like, but they, they right? keep churning until they find the player that actually makes the scheme and is a difference making player. So the Mostert acquisition and the Jeff Wilson acquisition behind it, where Miami was just like the guys we have are not it. Uh, 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 San Francisco having invested day two picks at running back two years in a row and being like, we're still going to trade for Christian McCaffrey. And part of the reason that people were, lambasting that trade was you've already sunk multiple day two picks into the running back position and hit on a day three pick in Elijah Moore just in the last couple of years. And, and you've given up all the stuff you've given up for Trey Lansing, not gotten anything out of that. And so to sink more capital than they already had into running back, but their answer was we still don't have, or their decision was we still don't have an answer at running back. We, we have some capital into something that we're seeking. That is a, a player that can make a difference in a, in a meaningful way. And I'm not saying they thought that Trey Sermon or Tyrion Davis Price was going to be Christian McCaffrey. It probably changed the way that they were approaching that decision when Christian McCaffrey became available. Well, you just but think the too, whole thing like is if, if these teams actually had the player evaluation side of it to match, where they were actually drafting the kinds of players who fit what they want to do, then but you can't hit how could they would no yeah. you can't yeah but like you go back in and look at Tyrion davis price who was a shock pick where they took him i mean he right. had like one broken tackle in all of his college career yeah that's and, and that's a little bit of exaggeration but but the data was out there that he couldn't play and so it, but but exactly what you're saying because the flip side of it is to take kind of the chief's approach where they're like okay we missed on ceh we've drafted some big athletic guys we'll just kind of go with it we don't want to make that mistake again and that's not the way to do it. It's like you make a mistake, you have to fix it. You don't just kind of sit with it and be like, well, you know, let's not replicate it. It's like, no, let's not also just be content to have that mistake then carry over for years either. Right. 
And, and and you're talking about the Tyrion Davis price pick. I will say, like, yeah, I mean, if they were picking better, that would be great. But it is interesting. And I think another data point to your point that they're looking for something unique or, you know, special that you, I think both Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay in the draft the last several years are two of the, or, or their, their organizations, whatever you want to say, are two of the organizations that have been most surprising with some of their picks and some of the decisions they've made. And they clearly, I think, are seeing something. So that they go out, I mean, I again, I go back to the Van Jefferson thing, which I'm obviously just kind of poking fun, but Tutu Atwell at his size to be a second round pick was a shock for a lot of people. And then Puka Nakua coming out of nowhere this year and being a guy that they clearly saw something in and, and are finding a way to leverage it. And so fascinating as a guy who didn't run a lot of a routes ever in college, never ran more than 300 routes, comes out in week one and he's a 90% route rate. And they're like, well, maybe the only thing that was wrong with Puka Nakua's profile was BYU and Washington decided that they didn't actually need to run him 90% of the routes, but we're just going to let him go out there and be a, a full-time receiver. We'll just try that, you know? And it, it has worked through one game at least, but he draws 15 targets and he has a really great game. They're, the players they're picking is, is unique. And just to throw in some positives about Tutu, he's tiny, right? But he's somebody who had a fantastic college profile and also brings speed. And these teams want to create the big play. So when you think about the two sides of this coin, right? And one of the things for me, I I know that Bill Belichick is in some ways out of fashion. And because they've struggled in this post-Tom Brady era, it's really easy to give basically all of the credit to Brady. And yet, and I've made this point on the show before, but just it, it continues to boggle my mind. When you go back through, when you look at these last 20 years of results for the Patriots defense, and you see this huge gap between yards allowed and points allowed. So when you think about why the Patriots were a two-decade dynasty, sure, extreme offensive efficiency and an all-time great quarterback is going to be a big part of it. But the flip side of it is that their defense was doing a lot of these things, whether it's schematically or not was accomplishing these objectives for like two decades. Yeah, It's like you had an advantage for two decades that nobody else or very few other teams were employing, but now everybody's employing it. So in some ways, that part of the Patriots' advantage has been diminished, you know, at least in a way. But so then you go to the other side of it and you think about what some of these teams are doing. And some of the teams like the Kansas City Chiefs have been beating the defense's through the extraordinary talent of one man in terms of a Patrick Mahomes. Now you do have a Travis Kelsey and he wasn't there in the first game. And that did seem to make a pretty big difference. You have Andy Reid, who's just a genius play caller and Reid has been able to create a lot of those small plays and to create them over and over and over and over. But when we think about what these Shanahan teams are doing and you think about what the profile is. And again, a lot of it goes back to your own personal aesthetics, your own personal like ways that you've been successful And a big part of, for me, the zero RB list through the years was to take smaller, faster guys who could create big plays and fade workload and size a little bit. Now, it's not that you're completely ignoring those things because you do know (laughs) that some of those things are going to be valuable at points, especially if you can get them at a decent price. But, you know, you go way back and you think of guys like a Chris Johnson. Certainly the most obvious example is a player like Jamal Charles, who, you know, after he had fully broken out, obviously isn't going to be cheap. But you're continuing to look for the next wave of that. And when you think about a Jonathan Taylor, for example, who did so much of his damage in 2021 based on the fact that he's, you know, one of the two or three guys in the NFL that even his size can take a carry and go 70 yards. And he has that threat constantly, right? Well, one of the things that you and I emphasized this season as being extremely important, at least to our process, and it's very much an open question as to whether or not it will work, but the change in ADP. So for me, the two really interesting things in week one were number one, the quarterback play and the total offensive production. And then number two, looking at this kind of contrast between what you and I have labeled as 
the priority target running backs and then the true dead zone running backs and understanding that those two things are very different, even if their ADPs are in the same basic range. So as we think about this, and, and one of the things I want to emphasize is that we could be here next week saying almost the exact opposite type of thing. Not that like we've, we've changed our analysis, but just that the results have changed because we know that the volatility for running back results is going to be very high. But when your offense has that elite running back in the contemporary era, I do think that it makes a difference. And you look at the guys who we targeted and were on the zero RB list, those types of things. You look at the guys who flashed in week one. And I have sort of the yards after contact per attempt list up here. You have Brees Hall, who's at 11.2. We obviously know he had an 80 plus yard run. You're going to get some numbers like that when you make that massive a run. Christian McCaffrey, 5.9. Jameer Gibbs, 4.9. Tyler Algier, 4.2. Chuba, who's somebody that, I mean, I don't know that that's going to work as a fantasy play because the Carolina Panthers aren't going to score any points, but 4.0. Then we actually have to give a little bit of a shout out to Joe Mixon, who's at 3.8. Austin Eckler, 3.6. Kenneth Walker, 3.4. James Cook, 3.4. Samaj P. Ryan, one of our sort of, you know, round 10, round 11 potential targets, 3.2. Travis Etn, 3.1. Etn probably has the signature touchdown run in week one. Those are the guys, right? And one of the things that's kind of hilarious, and Jameer Gibbs is not going to thrive on broken tackles this year. But one of the things that we mentioned in that, David Philippi mentioned in his sort of cool zero RB dynasty watch this week was that there were a variety of teams, including that Baltimore Ravens team that we referenced earlier that didn't have a broken tackle or forced miss tackle credited to their entire group of running backs for the whole weekend, right? Jameer Gibbs gets seven attempts is credited with five broken tackles and one forced miss tackle. Brees Hall gets 10 attempts is credited with three broken tackles and two Force missed tackles. Are those the, good? Those are really, <laughs> really high numbers, right? Again, you've got entire teams that turned up a zero for that. So the running back talent for me was the other thing that stood out as being a huge storyline in week one. And I'm going to continue to contend that it really matters and that that is going to be something that I mean, Jameer gives, I mean, he may not have five broken tackles the entire rest of the season, right? Again, that's not exactly the profile you're looking for. Although it was hilarious that on some of those plays, he's just shot out of a cannon. And then again, you're like, okay, go out of bounds. The last thing we need is our tiny explosive dude. He's not tiny, but to get hurt. And instead he's like layer, he's leveling these guys 15 yards down the field. Right. So And again, the Detroit Lions were an interesting team because along with the Falcons, who, despite the fact that we don't like what they did, had success with what they did, the Detroit Lions, they spring this big upset. It was frustrating they didn't use Gibbs more, but they went out in the draft. They picked Gibbs. They picked Laporta. Laporta looked excellent in week one. You do seem to have a contrast between the teams that think the running back talent in 2023 is going to change how their op their offenses function and help them beat these new difference these new defenses and the teams that don't and i keep going back to the things what are the defenses trying to stop the big plays as you say all the time and what running backs could potentially thwart that i mean it's not an alexander madison right it's a jameer gibbs it's a Brees hall it's a Bijan robinson it's a Travis Etienne. I mean, those guys really matter in 2023. Yeah, I think that's actually a really interesting silver lining to everything we're talking about with the cover to shells and where the NFL is going and all those things is we haven't had an answer to the running back puzzle. And the, the, the guys who play the running back position are some of the most fun players in the NFL. We're you know, all 
I don't know, not all of our listeners are as old as us, Sean, but growing up, I was going to say, you, you, you bought jerseys for running backs, right? I mean, the 90s, and the 2000s. I mean, these were the guys that scored 20 touchdowns, and they were the the fun thing to watch. Barry Sanders, I mean, come on. He's the most fun player of all time. Easily. Oh, well, or Dion. But, yeah, I mean, you have you, you have just an elite. He's, he's up there for sure. Bo Jackson is up there. Um Coach Jamal Jackson. Charles, more recently, is up there. I was uh, making the case that Brees Hall looks like a combination of Jonathan Taylor and David Johnson. I, I just say that all the time. It's probably pretty annoying at this point. You mentioned Bo Jackson. I would say that like Brees Hall, still not Bo Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's Bo Jackson. Right. Right. I mean, you watch it like, and, and look, Adrian Peterson had some weird stuff late in his career, obviously, of the stuff with his kid, and and we don't love to necessarily – glorify him as much i guess in in the entire world but um he's somebody that man when early in his career he was so fun to watch i mean just just another dude that i'll put out there but there are running backs that are that are it's just such a fun position and so yeah maybe there's a small silver lining to what you're saying where um the way to beat these defenses is going to be to have running backs who can be electric, who can gain yardage. You're going back to 1960s football in some respects, but it's like three yards in a cloud of dust. But who can be better than that? Who can add to that? Because you have to matriculate the ball down the field. You have to do the small game. You have, you have to not make mistakes. And so you have to not fumble and not throw interceptions but short passes and short runs have to be a part of it. And if you have a dynamic running back who can do the things that a B. John Robinson can do, that can do the things that Jonathan Taylor can do when he's out there. And it'd be fun to watch Barry Sanders in the modern NFL right now. I think he would be a pretty huge asset. And so that is sort of a silver lining, I think, where maybe we'll get back to I mean, certainly the whole running backs don't matter thing and, and, and the money they've made and all of that stuff is it's a major issue, I think, in, in, in football in the NFL. And, but a big part of it also relates to the offensive lines, and they're going to be a big part of why rushing games are successful and offenses are successful, and there's a, there's a symbiosis there. And, but I don't know. Yeah, maybe maybe the silver lining is the way that the game is going is going to need to center on running backs getting some of the due that they deserve because they do play a really hard position, short lifespans in the NFL. And, you know, when you see a guy like Christian McCaffrey obviously make an impact on the San Francisco offense, obviously, and, and with a diverse skill set, he's doing things that, that a lot of other running backs can't even do. But, you know, 65 yard touchdown run this week as well. And, and that is the part of his game that often gets missed. But the ability to hit on that, the ability to hit on what ETN did, the ability to make explosive plays, Brees Hall, that 83-yard run, I mean, absolutely destroyed the angle for multiple players. Yet the, the at the point of attack, Tredavious White is unblocked and breaks down, and White just blows right by him which makes the un unblocked defender completely whiff. And then he is sprinting right at Jordan Poyer. He's a good safety, and he's just blows right past him and splits the safeties and does it with so much explosiveness that the safety on the backside doesn't get him there, where for a lot of other running backs, even if you're able to get around Poyer back towards the middle of the field, the backside safety hits you. It's so hard to split that. And then, you know, eventually his run fades off towards the following sideline. And I had so many people on Twitter saying he got caught from behind. He's not where he was. And it's like, this guy, yeah, 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 probably was a touchdown for him last year. All right. Like, I'll, I'll probably admit that. There's also only five running backs in the entire NFL that could have hit that hole, could have made Tredavious White miss, unblocked the line of scrimmage, and then split the safeties with that type of explosiveness and gotten more than, like, 30 or 40 yards on that run. I don't think everyone is doing what Brees Hall did there. And, and so the, the implication of like, oh, he had an 83-yard run, but he would have housed it. 
It's like, yeah, I mean, you want to hold him to the standard of what his fully healthy self is, then I get that. But, like, let's not get it twisted. There was so much explosion on that play where he just makes good defensive players look like they don't know how to tackle or, or what have you. They don't know how to take an angle on a play. He just destroys angles with a, with a burst that is um, difference-making. I mean, difference-making. It's it, it seems to me like you're missing the fact that Bo Jackson would not have been caught from behind. Yeah, exactly. Bo Jackson would have housed that. There's a few people that would have housed that. And I think Brees Hall, six weeks from now, if he gets that opportunity again, is housing that. But well, with we all the know zigs that, that like, he's he putting up these well. crazy times. Yeah, I mean, he ran far more than... He ran 100 yards. yards. He's not going to have a play like that. I, that's, I wrote about it this week, but also, like, I mean, if you're at his own 40-yard line, it's a 60-yard touchdown, and we're not saying anything weird about it, right? But because they were at their own 10, he gets an 83-yard run, and people are going, well, he should have had 90. And I, I mean, yeah, but... Well, the thing I was frustrated by yards. is that the Bills defenders continue to try. I mean, if you've got... I don't know. It seems like he's taken a real beating. I don't even remember seeing this play necessarily, but if you've got Chase Claypool back there, then it would have been a touchdown. Uh, the uh, the thing with that too, and, and what you just described, I think it can be missed. And one of the things with, with Brees Hall and the evaluations of him coming out of college is that he's so smooth that his athleticism doesn't necessarily pop unless you know he's doing it against the greatest players in the world. And when you're watching him do it at Iowa State versus Big 12 players, you're like, well, you know, he's so smooth. It probably is just that the Big 12 is terrible. And you got a little bit of that with Jonathan Taylor in the Big 10. The thing about both of those guys is not only do you have this top end speed, but as they get through the line, which is an element you actually have to do, right? I mean, there are some really athletic players and backs out there who never can get through it. I mean, Isaiah Pacheco rarely gets through it. I mean, he's an easy one to kind of pile on, but there are all kinds of guys throughout the NFL who are pretty athletic. But Jonathan Taylor and Brees Hall can get through the line without throttling it down in many cases. And so when they get through because of their vision, because of that, what you just described, that ability to get hit the right angles and beat the guys at the line of scrimmage, then they can be gone. And just, you don't get that from other players. And it's almost a little bit of a different different thing too now in the contemporary NFL versus watching Adrian Peterson do it. Because one of the things with Peterson <laughs> is that you would frequently see the entire defense up at the line of scrimmage to stop him. And once he would break that initial barrier, you're like, well, you guys should have left somebody back there <laughs> once he gets through right. the line because now he's gone. I mean, these guys have to beat a lot of different players, and we see them do it consistently. Yeah, Derrick Henry is another one, as you said, that, that that made me think of it too. But, yeah, we've seen the Derrick Henry runs where he's just made, like, six defenders look like small children on the same play. And you're like, yeah, this guy matters. Like, he's, he's, a, he's a unique talent, obviously. Yeah, man, Sean, we could talk for a lot longer i'm excited for week two i'm excited to see where things go i'm hopeful that some of the offensive struggles we saw were just extended from the off season from a shorter preseason we live you know we live in a different world now where with 17 game seasons i mean this is one of the things that again you talk about the, the nihilist view of of football it's like if you want to point to some of the issues with some of this stuff it's the extra games and all of that where i mean the NFL is making its money, but I do think it's diluting its product a little bit. I will I will go out and say that pretty clearly where you have players that are – and teams that are way more willing and, – and we care about player safety and health as well, but they're way more willing to sit a player down for a week when there's more games and there's more of a longer view to look at. If you had – I mean, there was players at the time when they were going to 17, they were saying, we should actually be shortening and we should have two bye weeks for every team. And if you had a, if you had a system – where it was a 14 or 15 game season and two bye weeks for every team or even 16 games still, but two bye weeks and give these guys designated points of sitting throughout the season. I think you would see players playing through questionable tags more. Right. And, and that would make sense. Probably if you had, you know, grass fields instead of turf everywhere, you wouldn't have probably, I mean, I don't know. There's debates on that, but I, I tend to subscribe to the fact that, uh, 
the actual athletes are very much in unison and with their voices that the, 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 these fields should be grass, that when they play on turf, their hips, their bodies feel worse the next day. Um, and so that's a bummer. But you have all these elements of it where it's – grinding down the players who are the pro we just got done talking about how the elite talent is what wins and what matters to the sport and yeah i mean the extra games and all that stuff and, and so anyway i'm hopeful that week one was part of that was part of because the teams i think on the individual team level do handle it well and they say well you we have 17 games to worry about we're going to sit you down when you're questionable we're going to not push you in the preseason too much but then one of the things that might might be what we saw a little bit in week one is some of these teams weren't really ready to play. I mean, you can make the case Joe Burrow is just not really ready to play yet with his calf injury. And so a lot of um, a lot of stuff to, to consider there and parse there. But hopefully we see things improve into week two, into week three and, and going forward. And, yeah, I mean, I wish we did have two buys, all that other stuff I just decided to throw out there. But I, I wish we did have more of an environment that protected the players from themselves a little bit and protected the teams. And then, but also, you know, in some ways it would make every game matter a little more. And then you'd wind up for, for us, for fantasy football, you'd wind up with players that were basically trying to play every game, which is the way it was when we grew up. And these days it's not because the players aren't tough, but like the goal of trying to play every game, and that can't be a goal anymore. It's like, it's almost like players need to, understand they should sit a couple games when they get banged up and get healthy. Uh, one of the probably contributing factors to Aaron Rodgers' Achilles injury was that he had a calf injury in the in the preseason. I saw some of the Twitter doctors mentioning that. And so you have, you know, a lack of strength in the area and it potentially could have led to to part of the injury or, you know, the, the risk of the injury occurring at, you know, at his age when he's already injured, et cetera. Anyway, it's just one of those things where, we're, I'm not sure that the NFL's exact product and the way that they're doing things is um, benefiting from their business decisions, the people involved benefiting from their business decisions. But hopefully we'll see, you know, in the next couple of weeks, an uptick from week one, we can maybe blame a short off season, short preseason for some of what we saw in week one, you know, a couple weeks down the road. So I, I, I'm optimistic. I'm going to throw out the idea that all formations and all pre-snap movement should be legal. We want the NFL to take the next step and create more variety, more creativity, more explosiveness, more scoring, as you mentioned, more excitement. But Ben, I even with a lot of the difficulties that offenses ran into in week one, I did feel like there were just so many fun things that happened. And I think the future of this season is so bright. The elite QBs will get it figured out. We didn't get a chance to mention it today, but despite them not really moving the ball very effectively, I thought CJ Stroud looked fantastic in week one. There were certainly some positives for Bryce Young and for Anthony Richardson. You have some positives for the Falcons and Desmond Ritter, even though he doesn't throw the ball. You've got positives for Sam Howell in terms of how they go right back to him after the fumble six. You've got some pops. Even though it was a gross game, I thought that there were a lot of silver linings in Raiders Broncos. A lot of things to be excited about. And so I'm I'm looking forward to Sunday. I'm looking forward to tonight. Looking forward to being able to do these shows with you next week. It's been so much fun. So that'll do it for today's episode of Stealing Bananas. I am Sean Siegel. With me as always is Ben Gretsch. Make sure you follow him at Yards Per Gretsch. If you missed his two Stealing Signals posts to start this week, that's a mistake you want to remedy, especially with the Nihilist Guide to Fantasy Football <laughs> coming out. Make sure you get over there and subscribe to that. Ben's betting project with Dalton Cates is Stealing Lines. You don't want to miss that. Ben and our best buddies, Patrick Corrine and Peter Overzet are starting their new ship chasing in-season process this week tonight, where they do a live watch party for Thursday Night Football. That is going to obviously be 
appointment and must watch viewing. We'd also love to have you guys over at Rotoviz. You can use the coupon code RVRADIO2023 for a 10% discount at checkout. We've got some new tools. We've got some big articles from Blair Andrews, Dave Cabin, Curtis Patrick that I think everybody will enjoy. But we've also got a wave of new writers where the feedback on them has been fantastic. Love what those guys are doing. Appreciate all of their great work. Really proud of our in-season content this year and what our plans are all the way through. So anyway, if you're enjoying the show, we'd love you guys to subscribe at Stealing Signals. We'd love you to subscribe at Rotoviz. We love you. We'll talk to you soon.